It's poetry time with Cam. Woo! That's my new stinger. I hope you like it. It's a good I, it's a good stinger. <laughs> I have a poem for you today. Oh yay. Today's poem's a little shorter. It's by Meg Day, who has a PhD from the University of Utah and has written and been the poetry editor for Quarterly West, wrote a lovely book called Last Solemn at Sea Level in 2014 and has continued to build a career in poetry and has a very interesting poem I thought you'd want to hear called Batter My Heart, Transgendered God. Batter my heart, transgendered God, for yours is the only ear that hears. Place fear in my heart, where faith has grown, my senses dull and reassures my blood that it will never spill. Show every part to every stranger's anger. Surprise them with my drawers, full up of maps that led to vacancies and chart the distance from my pride, my core. Terror, do not depart, but nest in the hollows of my loins and keep me on all fours. My <laughs> knees. Bring me to them. Force my head to bow again. Replay the murders of my kin until my mind's made new. Let Adam's bite obstruct my breath till I respire men and press his rib against my throat until my lips turn blue. You, O duo, O twin, whose likeness is kind, unwind my confidence and noose it round your fist so I might know you in vivid impermanence. I think this is one of the most deep poems that we've <laughs> we've dissected on this podcast so far. I don't think it's meant to be sexually overt, but <laughs> no, but the the knees and loins part of it were very interesting. And it's funny because I also it's part of why I like this is because there were some things in here that seem to have some interesting dual meanings. But to come off of that, the nest in the hollow of my loins and then replay the murders of my kin is literally the next line here. Yeah. Which gives a... And then the part that, too, really led me to this was the Adam's bite obstruct my breath, press his rib against my throat. It just speaks to such an interesting violence in this. Yeah, but I think that it is... Oh, I'm not used to dissecting poetry like this <laughs> since I got out of school, but it really does speak to the dichotomy between the especially Christian God and uh, people who are trans and unaccepted by those radical people. It's amazing when people find solace in faith to me uh, as somebody who doesn't. And I never want to dissuade anybody from finding solace, finding what they need anywhere in a, a safe way that's going to be protective for your humanity. <laughs> So that, to me, is spoken in here, too, of, you're totally right, the tension of religion, the tension of maybe being somebody who's transgender and believes in a higher power and wonders about the evilness in the world towards trans people. Yeah, especially by radical people of a similar faith. That's, I think, really where we see this dichotomy of there are a lot of trans people who believe in higher powers, and yet so many faiths, I should say, so many Western faiths. Yeah believe in like not accepting trans people and i just don't believe that <laughs> and as we've unpacked in the past for reasons that we just can't comprehend yeah <laughs> it's mistranslations of the bible in the case of christianity led to the homophobia and transphobia that we see today it's hard for me to say that's really what <laughs> that's what really the what the plan were was intention. Yeah. from the beginning was <laughs> let's really vilify this community i mean the picking out specific things from the Bible is something that we could talk about for hours. The Ten Commandments of, I don't remember the exact wording, but it's do no harm to your neighbor or something like that. Like, they just decide to ignore that part of it. Right. <laughs> Especially when Unless it, it fulfills my cause and my needs. That's, yeah. Then the commandment doesn't apply. <sighs> Hi, I'm Anna, a transgender person. And I'm Cam, your dad. And this is The Transgender, a podcast chronicling my transition. And a cisgender man learning how to support it. I'm tackling the opening topic today. Sit down, Tackle it's it. my time. No, <laughs> it's Anna <honest> story time. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I wanted to today talk about the dichotomy between viewpoints, similar to the poem that we heard earlier about the people who are trans and have only ever experienced hardship, at least that's what they'll tell you, 
and want everybody to feel a similar way about talking about the trans experience and only talking about the hardship and only talking about how we're oppressed and how we need to always be fighting and never satisfied versus something similar to our podcast, which is I don't abide by the belief that we only need to be talking about the hardship and we only need to be talking about the struggle. Those are things that we definitely talk about, but my main point for why I want to do this podcast is to engage our cis allies. Right. And if we're only ever talking about the doom and gloom, we're going to alienate all of the people who we need to support us and to back us up. And for me, I've really followed your lead in what is important for us to talk about. And we decided early on that there were two components of this podcast that we really want to lead into. One was the humor, because... You and I make each other laugh. That's just the thing that we like to do <laughs> as two humans. And and we knew that people would maybe like to hear that side of this, so that this isn't a talk news show. We're not really getting into the really hefty day-to-day -day news cycle. We're talking about things that can be hard, but also trying to find the humor and the light side in those things. And then the other thing that you've done is, you, from the beginning, you said, we need to talk gender euphoria. So I think it was probably two episodes <laughs> in when you were like, you know what? It would be really nice to cap these things off with something really positive. Let's talk gender euphoria. And I really have appreciated that. And so have our audiences. Yeah. It is something that to me really speaks volumes. When I was growing up and I, the only thing that I had was the internet, all I heard were the stories of trans suicide, of trans killings, of people who have struggled. And I have talked about that. I've talked about losing people to trans suicide, to mass killings, to the struggles that trans people experience every day. It's not something that I talk about lightly, and we definitely don't want to try and diminish those experiences by bringing light and humor to the trans experience overall. But we can't focus solely on those experiences. We can't focus solely on the bad. Because if we do that, where do we see the fun? Where do we see the joy? Where do we see the trans experience that we all get to experience eventually? Whether being able to come out or living as yourself in whatever sort of next life you think of, whatever you believe in next, living as your true self there. I well, I think that true self piece is such a, we're trying to be authentic human beings here. And that was something that was challenging and scary from the beginning of this podcast. But we wouldn't <laughs> yeah. be authentic human beings and truly living that if we weren't trying to either find the humor in things or create <laughs> the inappropriate humor in things. <laughs> because that's an important part of our storytelling journey and what we look for. I will be the first to admit that hardship is a part of being trans. It's a part of the human experience, and it's even more so a part of the trans experience. But I am so exhausted of only hearing about the hardship, of only hearing about the struggle that people went through to get to a point where they finally feel able to talk about that. I want to talk about where they're at. I want to talk to people about, hey, I recognize and I understand and I see all of the hard labor and challenge that you put into this. And I am not in any way diminishing that. It is something that I talk about personally on this podcast a lot. But I want to talk about as well, equally, if not more, where you're at now. How do you feel? How are you experiencing joy? What are your euphorias? It's something that matters so much to me as a human, look, trying to look at the bright side of this world. and. I really just want to share that with all of you. Share that the trans experience is hard. It sucks sometimes. And I will be the first one to admit that it is a dangerous thing. But I also want to be the person who comes to you every week and gives you a little bit of light and a little bit of hope as well. So from that truly emotional place that I think was really important for us to air out, you want to talk about robots? <laughs> I would love to talk about robots. <laughs> you want to talk about unfeeling machines and how machines adapt to a world where gender identity is fluid. So let me start with, we're nerds. I really want to get you into programming at an early age. And maybe it was just because that was dad's thing <laughs> that he was excited about. I, you didn't take up to it quite as much as I thought you would. I didn't. It's really interesting because now, looking back, I have enough programming knowledge where I want to get into it and just not the drive enough to like really dive into it hard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because I think the way that you got to it, and I'm watching Oliver do this too, the way that you got to it was through, I want to do something in Minecraft. <laughs> 
<laughs> and yeah. <laughs> how do I write a piece of code or how do I manipulate the programmable blocks, man blocks? So I, all that to say, oh, go ahead. I will say, though, the way that we are teaching code does not appeal to everyone. Like for me, when I was learning code, a lot of what I used was Khan Academy. And they have really nice ways to teach code to young kids. But it never really appealed to me. Like the dragging and dropping of like yeah. pieces. I think I would have honestly rather preferred just sitting there writing out the code on Linux or Python or something. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I've heard that feedback before, too. So... If you are looking for the basics, here's what it is. Really, everything that we do in technology is based on a one or a zero. That's the heart, the root, and literally the early computers filled an entire room. I'm sure I'm speaking <laughs> to a lot of people that understand this, but with one wire in a one jack and one wire in a zero jack. And then after you did a thousands of those, then you could do a simple math problem. What was 6,000 plus 47. That's literally computing. It's all based on binary, which I find very funny and relevant to the trans experience of we all are based on a binary and to get to the more advanced stuff, speaking in like computer terms here, if you're non-binary and you look at the world and you're like, oh, these people are all in their ones and zeros binary. I'm right. not like the next level of i am a apple pc that the first macbook <laughs> that's i want to just share that with all of you of computers and the gender binary are not that different at their core components so are you saying that linux is non-binary is that the <laughs> <laughs> listen it's got that little penguin that penguin <laughs> is definitely non-binary non linux penguin i love that <laughs> So the ones and zero parallel is important in this because we think about, obviously, the gender binary and the not gender non-binary because the binary doesn't really <laughs> exist. Gender is a continuum and a spectrum. And the agender people, they just pulled the plug on the whole machine and walked out of there. <laughs> Shut it all down. They're living <laughs> off the grid. So computers have evolved as well beyond the binary. We have a lot of tools now that have machine learning, even just as simple as now you can create a list. And it's not just are you male or are you female? but you can put in a whole slew of choices as well as a write your own in choice. And I think that's important as we're talking about how we teach computers to process information. And unfortunately, we're finding that garbage in, garbage out is a big thing we talk about <laughs> with a code or anything else. Whatever, if you're putting in stupid transphobic, if you literally copied and pasted the internet into the AI and said, here it is, buddy, how much of its conversation is going to eventually get to Hitler? <laughs> I mean, it, what is it? <laughs> it's, it's 12 degrees of hit to Hitler or something like that for right. the Wikipedia challenge. Like, how fast can you get to Nazi Germany by just cl clicking on Wikipedia links? And what we teach computers to do is important and how we use them. So I want to give a few examples of things that, and I, some of these I think you're aware of, and I'd love to hear your perspective, of just some like purposefully transphobic ways that we have used technology. And I want to start with facial recognition, because I think that is probably the most problematic of the AI systems that I can identify. It is something that I don't think a lot of us really think about until something big breaks. Right. Governments using facial recognition in their CCTV systems to pick out people who that movie, I can't remember what it was called, but they like Minority Report. Yeah, Minority or, Report, yeah, where they few, like yep. pick people out who are like going to commit a crime. Yep. Yep. I know that I've heard this, especially in China, where they would pick people out for like things and be like, we're going to monitor this person, specifically religious and ethnic minorities, unfortunately. But yeah, this is how Uyghurs have been rounded exactly, up in, yeah. in China. So what you're talking about has a specific name and it's called predictive policing. And it's the ability to code facial recognition, actually all sorts of different things, the listening devices, satellite. So all kinds of information can be inputted and tell that information if this many people who look like this are <laughs> acting in this way, then send a squad car to that place. Uh, and you could just imagine, I just see your face cringing, how quickly that can be a super problematic issue. And this is where... It it, not intersectionality. Even, oh, sorry, not even ahead. just for trans people. This is an issue for everyone. Right. Like... I, we are very anti-establishment here at the Transgender Pod. <laughs> yes. Just imagine if we have a lot of non-white, non-cis listeners. Imagine 
for our cis people if a trans person who had ill intentions got a hold of this system and said, any cis person who does this thing, just go and send a squad car to them. They didn't do anything illegal at this point, but they're cis and they maybe will do something eventually. So we're going to send a squad car to them to go check them out. No, that's- I appreciate that because that's exactly where I was just about to go is that that's the parallel to intersectionality in this because you're talking exactly the right language. Where predictive policing is being used is on people who have black or brown skin. Uh-huh. That, that is truly the predictive policing that has been done in the past. And the question is, are you getting innocent people wrapped up in policing because of the way that they are behaving or the way that their face looks? And do we really feel like that's appropriate I or think, reliable? <laughs> I, I, like going back to Minority Report, I feel like the whole premise of that movie was dismantling the idea that predictive policing is a good idea. It is a, a horrible idea. It is not something that should ever be done. And yet, governments are like, oh, let's do this. Let's follow this idea. No, it's bad. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think maybe I can move to something a little bit related, and that is facial recognition used against. <laughs> I, yep, I'm going to say against <laughs> gig workers, remote workers. So there was a classic case of Uber putting a, you need to check your face into this app on a regular basis in order to be able to keep going with your Ubering to make sure that it's you driving the car, which it sounds great, except for the system specifically chose a binary. And as trans Uber drivers were finding euphoria in either facial feminization surgery or just hormone therapy over time, the software was blocking them out because it was saying, sorry, you don't look like our profile of what you should be. And we're not even saying a picture of your face pre and post. That's not what it's doing. It is literally saying, here's the identity of this person. They should have white skin and they Uh should have these certain facial qualities that match a certain gender. And that is the problem. I This is something that I also really wanted to touch on with facial recognition. And it's not something that we talk a lot about on this podcast because we are two white people. But inherently, facial recognition has always had problems identifying and correctly gendering people of color. Yes. As we will get to a little bit later in this section, it is a big problem. <laughs> And so you think about why and we think about what a computer can know. And maybe let's just be honest about the type of people that maybe are programming, demographically programming these systems, which are probably a lot of cis white male people identifying people. I think luckily these things are changing and the more diversity there is in the field, the more likely it is that these problems are going to be fixed. But if you're feeding in this computer a bunch of pictures of cis white males and then it sees something that isn't a picture of a cis white male, it doesn't know what to do with that data. And now all of a sudden you've created a transphobic or a a racist racist (laughs) computer system (laughs) because of the information you're feeding it. I think one of the highest demographics that consistently is getting miscategorized are black women. Black women get miscategorized, I think, at a rate of eight to one. It is ridiculously high. Don't quote me on that. But I'm pretty sure that's about <laughs> no, that's right. the rate that it is at. I've seen lots of different statistics, and I think the point is absolutely true that they're, again, demographically, the systems can be challenging. Now, I want to talk about when we decide specifically to tell a system to do something that ends up being transphobic. So the first one <laughs> is, I think, maybe a little simpler to talk about that, and that is International Women's Day decided to accidentally go full turf, and they created a system that identified women so it could provide a ticket to International Women's Day events, and that system decided not to allow trans women to be a part of International Women's Day activities. It is a tale as old as time of women excluding trans women from activities that are supposed to be women-oriented. And I'm not saying all women. I'm not even saying that all women who are in these and are programming these are transphobic, but it only takes one or two to allow all of the hate to come spilling out the floodgates. It It is, oh, it just bothers me so much. Like, trans women are women, trans men are men. Let's maybe stop trying to say that trans men are actually women and should be included in women's spaces and that trans women are actually men and shouldn't be allowed in women's spaces because that's just wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking as a trans woman who has benefited from women's spaces and who now feels extremely unsafe 
outside of women's spaces. Like, yeah. I have had surgery, and that makes me extremely vulnerable to ill-doing men, right. especially. Right. You now have a target there. And so having those spaces and including people who need, need to feel comfortable in those spaces because they are women <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> leads to something that I think you and I more recently learned about is Giggle, Giggle. the women-only <laughs> social media app that has now come out via some research as the app was specifically programmed to exclude trans women. That was a choice that was made. The, yeah, the choice was made. The founder of it has now come out in huge support of J.K. Rowling and just massive turf. So for those of you who don't know, Giggle is a, quote, women's only social media app like Twitter, where women can sign up for the app. And in order to prevent men, and I'm putting that in quotes here, they have a facial recognition system. It has been extremely transphobic and very racist. <laughs> yes. I think this is a UK-based project, and it like systematically blocks women of color, and especially trans women of color, from accessing the app, as well as blocking white trans women from accessing the app, and blocking some cis women as well, which I just find hilarious. If you want to ruin an afternoon, go on the app stores and start reading the five-star reviews for it, because it's full of transphobia. Full of transphobia. But they've also been review-bombed by folks who are uh, yes. supportive of the trans community, too, so I... Uh, yes. <laughs> the two is, sides of that coin. It is very funny, as well, seeing trans women who have had euphoria because they're able to get into the app... <laughs> See, again, the, the, where the humor can be complicated, <laughs> exactly. this is one of those places. The other type of recognition software I thought that I would like to talk about is something we've mentioned before, so I won't belabor it, but that is Airport Body Scanners. Uh, <sighs> Here's what does. You've programmed a range of what is normal in a quotation marks into the machine, an algorithm that says by a, what? 85% chance, I don't actually have those statistics, that somebody having this kind of, what are we, should we say, shape in various areas of their body are going to then be flagged as having a binary one way or the other. And I'm looking at the screen capture of the software right here, and there's a blue button scan and there's a pink button scan. And those are the two options that the security person receives in order to find out what the gender of the person going through the scanner is. I will say the TSA, based out of America, has stated that they are trying to do better about this. But again, all of this goes back to to institutional transphobia, racism. My partner and I have recently been talking about this, and they and their father both, without a fail, get stopped for extra right. screenings by TSA. Whereas I, a very white person, actually got randomly selected for TSA pre-check one time that I was flying. <laughs> so... <laughs> It is very problematic, all of this system, and I do know that the TSA has made a promise and a commitment to start trying to better program systems and train staff to understand that trans people exist. However, every website that you go to that has anything about trans acceptance includes a spot where it says traveling as trans and ways to make that safer for you and your stuff. Hormones are very challenging to travel with. Breast Absolutely. forms are extremely challenging to travel with. Packers, I mean, you will like, be stopped and searched if yeah. they see a breast form or a packer because they think it's drugs. They just think it's drugs. They always That's think it's the drugs. Thing. It's, it's just, it's gotta be drugs. And so you will be pulled aside, which is really transphobic and racist. Yeah. I'm sorry. Again, it's systems. I don't want to say TSA agents are. They are following the best tools that they have available to them to make these decisions and the policies that they have to abide by. But it's really unfortunate. And I think that there's room for change. My question is, why do we bother with gender at all at TSA yeah. screening? Why is that an important part of the screening process? Or are there better ways for us to identify the individual who is going through matches their documentation? That's it's just a problem. And trans people having to arrive two or three hours before their flight, just so that in case they get stopped, they are able to go through all that process is unacceptable, especially when a cis person, a cis white man can get through in a second. Yeah. So can I talk about two tools that are actually pretty euphoric for trans folks and problematic to the rest of the world right now? And 
Uh, so I wanted to bring them up specifically. One is a tool that actually really got me thinking about this topic initially, and that is ChatGPT that has gone absolutely wild lately. So I've, much so that companies yeah, are scrambling to integrate it. This is something that I've not heard a lot about, but I've heard yeah. the name. So please tell me a little bit about ChatGPT. So we've had a technology that allows for a live back and forth conversation with a robot for a long time. We've had that technology, but what has had to happen in the past is you essentially sit and program in every single possible response that you think is going to be able to match something that the human user would use. And that was how that was done. AI has allowed us to break that a little bit, but all of a sudden ChatGPT and the foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that led this research, ended up taking this whole concept and creating an artificial intelligence chatbot that will respond to you with real life answers in a way that sounds human. And it has just absolutely impacted English professors are freaking out right now because you can ask ChatGPT to write your paper for you, this put specific heard, things that yeah. you want in there. Now, somebody that teaches college courses, I will say that on the flip side, our plagiarism response tools have begun to integrate some software that helps us recognize these things. But truly, the better this technology gets, the more it's going to sound like a human. And how in the world do you figure that out? This is something that I think you and I might disagree on. And I believe that having a robot write your essay is honestly fine. Yeah. I genuinely think that school academia is really racist and transphobic and just bad overall. And so, fuck! If a robot can write your essay for you and you can learn what you want to learn and what you need to take away from university, I don't see any problems with that, <laughs> to be we, entirely we actually, honest. <laughs> we don't disagree on that. We fully agree. I read a quote that said, we adapted to calculators in... <laughs> The profession of teaching, I think we can adapt to new technologies in English writing. I fully agree. I think it is insane for us to think that every single student can express what they learned through a 10 page paper. I, I just I and I know for sure, again, teaching that many students don't have and the ability to express themselves. I know that this that. is something that you as a teacher have expressed to me, at least, which is like you have very strict guidelines for the, that you have to follow yeah. to grade these students. And a lot of your students are not cis white people who are able to write in this like traditional way. It is so terrible that we still as a system of academia are like write exactly like the cis white person from 1812 wrote. That's not how people work. <laughs> Digest these concepts and write them to me exactly the way that your professor would, which is just not fair and it doesn't work. But that's the bad part about this. I want to talk about the good part because I think it's really interesting. So I said garbage in, garbage out. This system is really <laughs> trans positive, LGBTQ positive language was in. And they also taught it to be self-aware about <laughs> its inability to have beliefs or biases, which I think is so... I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read you some snippets. I asked it the question, are you transphobic? And it said, no, I'm a machine and do not have the ability to hold beliefs or biases, including those related to gender identity. My responses are based on patterns of data that use to train me. And so I said, okay, how should we treat trans kids? And he, I don't know why I said he, the chat GPT that we're I have now assigned a gender. I don't, robots that was now. insanity. I don't know why my brain did that. Transgender children should be treated with the same respect, dignity, and love as other children. They should be supported in their gender identity and be allowed to express themselves in a way that feels authentic to them. And then it goes on and on with tips about allowing children to be free to express themselves and explore the world. And I just, That's I was like, amazing. okay. <laughs> So then lastly, I asked it, tell me a transgender joke. And it said it would be inappropriate and disrespectful to tell a joke about transgender people or their experiences. Everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of their gender identity. Wow. That's better than <laughs> a robot is better at comedy than Dave fucking Chappelle. <laughs> yeah. Yep. More, more thoughtful about how your words might actually impact people. Oh, my God. This is amazing. I had no idea. Yeah about this and i'm so glad that we are training robots to be trans positive <laughs> i think i want somebody to use this tool and be like oh the robot said it should treat people with respect and dignity so i i never thought of that and oh. just yeah so the last tool i want to talk about is complicated because we have close artist friends yes but 
the AI art trend, which I think many people have heard of, or at least seen people post online, and then specifically the app Lenza, which does an incredible thing, and that is uses this really cool AI art technology and their own selfie processing data that they use and made it so that you can create these really euphoric for everyone photos that are like you in a starfighter pilot's outfit or you with a sword slaying a dragon. And what I have found uh, reading about this is that in the trans community, if you gear it correctly and you tell it what you want it to spit out you can get some really gender euphoric art out of these tools yeah i have seen a lot of gender euphoric art from these tools and it is amazing in no way am i advocating for ai art to take over the world as we've learned from things like nfts computer programmed art is cool but it's not art it, you can't and it exploits artists and it really it's does the, the robot's not creating the art i'm sorry we've not gotten yeah. to that point where <laughs> the robot just creates beautiful art without zero information input you had to put somebody's art in there to make that happen and a lot of the like a lot of the art that they're putting into these machines is stolen from artists yep. which is something that's really complicated and it is not my area of expertise to talk about that however i love that there is euphoria and things that we can get from these that is really nice because I do have a lot of artist friends and it's really hard to encapsulate euphoria for someone in a piece of art. I've had it done a couple of times, but it's hard for people necessarily to translate that into the exact kind of image or similar to the image that somebody is trying to put forward. And I think AI does a very good job and is a good basis for some artists to learn how to do that. Absolutely. Those, those are my thoughts on AI art. I think that it's really cool to look at, but I also don't like that it takes advantage of artists who spent hours and hours and time of their lives to make it. Exactly. So I think just to put a bow on this whole conversation, I think as with all technology tools, it is how you use it. And so if we're using these things in responsible ways, we're teaching systems to identify gender and race with a lot more nuance and are thinking about how somebody is impacted by the decision that a computer might make. I think that this is a great thing for us and there's a lot of opportunity. But unfortunately, I think we're still in a phase right now where these tools are being used for evil rather than good <laughs> and in ways that are really exploitative. And I think we all need to keep an eyeball out for that. And cisgender folks need to be advocating that these tools can be really harmful. Yes, I completely agree. Thinking about our conversations from earlier, I really wanted to bring back to our gender euphoria and this podcast episode today on a very high note. Today's gender euphoria is sent in by Anonymous, and I just want to say to the person who did send this in, thank you very much. You have been very active, and I really appreciate it. Friend of the show. Friend of the we show. We know who you are. We know who you are, and <laughs> we appreciate you. Last week, I sat in my room, and I realized there was not going to be anyone else in the house for the next few hours. So I got my little black dress out from where I keep it at the back of the wardrobe tied up my hair, threw on some shaping leggings, and spent the afternoon just doing normal stuff around the house while I had it to myself. It felt validating and incredible, like a rare occasion where I was able to give myself permission to be me. I cannot wait to, sometime in the future, feel that every day. I'm so happy that you felt this, and I cannot wait for you and everybody to get to experience this every single day as well. I have to tell you, from my own personal euphoria, it feels amazing just to be able to be yourself every single day. Yeah. In your own spaces, too. That's the first big step, and I'm glad you're starting to find that. If you have questions about transitioning or supporting someone who is transitioning, and you'd like us to talk about it on the show, please shoot an email to questions at transgendapod.com, click the Chat With Us button on our website, or DM us on social media. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron on our Patreon. Just like our newest patron, Amy M. Thank you so much, Amy. Thanks, Amy. Be sure to check out our episode description for links to resources on today's topics. And a huge thank you to Eli Oberman for producing our theme music and Frey Shakama for editing. Thanks for listening. I've been Cam. I've been Anna. And this has been The Transgender. Love you all, except the bigots. Would you like to support our podcast? Well, you're in luck. We have a Patreon now. 
Just visit patreon.com slash transgendapod, and for as little as $3 a month, you can support the content that we're creating. And for $20 a month, you can join our sticker club, which provides you with a monthly live stream, a shout out on the podcast, and a sticker every month from ourselves and creators that we adore. Again, just visit patreon.com slash transgendapod, and thank you for all your support.